Chapter 2 Six days after the fire that ripped up Amelia's dreams and turned our family and life into a pile of ash, Mom and I stepped off a plane directly onto the tarmac at the tiny airport in Hibbing, Minnesota. I was being shipped off to my grandparents' house for the summer to get me out of the way while my parents tried to fix everything I broke on the night of the fire. We hadn't visited Grandma and Grandpa at their tiny house in Thistledew, Minnesota for more than four years. The last time we were in Minnesota, I had just turned eight, and Amelia was a few weeks shy of five. On that trip, to make the drive from Chicagoland to the middle of nowhere Minnesota more bearable for everyone, my parents had driven all the way through the night. My sister and I slept almost the whole time, booster seats side by side in the middle row of the minivan, while my parents traded off driving and sleeping shifts every three hours. We'd left at dinner time, stopping for crinkly paper wrap fast food burgers and chocolate milk and colorful plastic bottles. After dinner, Mom and Dad had put on a movie for us while they chatted quietly in the front seats. I woke up with the sun and remember Mom blowing a morning kiss at me in the rearview mirror. Life had gotten busy since then, with Amelia's gymnastics and climbing club, my soccer and babysitting, Mom's crazy caseload and Dad's nursing school classes, and now his weird and unpredictable work schedule as a newbie nurse, so we hadn't had a chance to get back to visit Thistledew again since. Instead, Grandma B and Grandpa Howard came to see us once a year, looking out of place and slightly bewildered by our lives the whole time they were staying with us. Grandma puttered around the house, rearranging things Dad had just put away and asking nosy questions. Grandpa spent the whole week eating ice cream and, Amelia would say with a giggle, looking like a caged wild animal. I liked when they visited, even if they were something like strangers. But it was also sort of a relief when they left, since our lives could go back to normal. As soon as we waved goodbye, I always heard Mom let out a deep breath that I hadn't realized she'd been holding in. Four summers and a destroyed life later, Mom and I traveled to Minnesota by plane together. Just the two of us, for the first time ever. This trip, instead of burgers, we shared a big bag of trail mix. I cherry-picked all the off-brand M&Ms out of the bag. But Mom didn't seem to notice that she'd been left with just stale raisins and peanuts. She didn't seem to notice me, either. But that was fair, considering the circumstances. On the tiny plane, there were no movies to pass the time or distract us. I just stared out the window, trying to find shapes in the fields carved into the landscape below us. I listened to the playlist my friend Anne had made me for the trip, trying not to think about how, just a week earlier, Amelia and I had been stretched out on our backyard deck searching for shapes and stories in the clouds overhead. That day, she told me she was planning to become a space explorer, and she'd already started inventing a special suit that would allow her to jump out of her shuttle and hop from cloud to cloud. Amelia's plans and goals changed day by day, but they were always huge. She had no fears, and nothing could ever hold her back until now. We stopped inside the terminal to get my luggage. A neighbor had given me a suitcase to use for the summer since all of ours had burned in the fire. It was filled with clothes donated by my friends. Beckett let me take his favorite soccer, soccer jersey, which smelled like his house and made me miss home and my friends too much, so I probably wasn't even going to wear it. I got a bunch of Ann's t-shirts and shorts and a brand new pair of flip-flops that I knew she loved and hadn't even worn yet. She must have secretly snuck them into the pile of stuff when I wasn't looking, because I never would have taken them if I'd known. June gave me her lucky jeans. They'd gotten a little too short for her, but the gift still made me feel good, and I got a couple pairs of barely worn shoes from one of my soccer teammates. I also had all new, thank goodness, underwear and socks. Dad ordered some stuff online, and it had it all delivered to Anne's house to round out my summer wardrobe. The only things from my old life that survived the fire were my phone and the clothes I was wearing that night. And miracle of miracles, Astrid the Ostrich, who had been keeping me company on the couch while my parents were gone. I threw away all my clothes from that night. I never wanted to see them again since they would always remind me of the worst day of my life. Astrid was the only thing I had left. 
She smelled like smoke, and her fur was all nubby from when she had gotten sprayed by the firefighters' hoses. But at least I had one part of my former life to carry along with me for the summer. I was hoping I could toss her in the washing machine and dryer at Grandma's and restore her to her former fluffy glory. While I waited for my giant borrowed suitcase to plop onto the conveyor belt, Mom slipped away and called to check in with Dad to see how Amelia was doing. Nothing major had changed, she told me, which I guess was good news. She was still in the hospital and would be for a long time. But I guess staying the same was better than her getting worse. Everyone at the hospital kept telling me to remember that. Outside, Grandma was waving to us from the pickup lane on the other side of the airport doors, her old tan Buick idling alongside a handful of other cars. She looked just like I remembered. Her hair was cut short like Mom's, but it was much messier. Unlike me and Mom, Grandma B had hair that had faded from chestnut brown to a pure snowy white. Everything about the way Grandma carried herself screamed, no nonsense, just like Mom, but in a totally different way. My Grandma wore an embroidered sweatshirt, jeans that looked like they'd been around for years and had at least another century left in them, and not one spot of jewelry or makeup. Mom wasn't high maintenance at all, but she never went anywhere without a perfectly coordinated outfit and simply but elegant jewelry, and her face and body language oozed the kind of confidence that made her look like the sort of person you didn't want to mess with. When we got to the car, Mom offered to drive home from the airport, but Grandma looked at her like she was crazy. Think I'm too old to drive, she asked, lifting her thin, almost invisible eyebrows. Mom sighed. I waited for her to say something funny in response, but instead she just slid into the back seat and motioned for me to take the front. I hadn't even called shotgun. Amelia and I had a running game of shotgun. Even though she was both too young and too short to ever actually sit in the front seat, my parents had just deemed me tall enough, finally. She liked to see who could call dibs first whenever we got outside. She almost always won. Grandma and I talked about school while she drove along the desolate backcountry road that led to my new home for the summer. This time, it would be me feeling out of place in their home. I stared out the window and tried to imagine what a few months spent in the middle of nowhere would be like. Grandpa liked to hunt. What if I was forced to eat deer meat? When they visited, Grandma always made this stew that had an undefined, unidentifiable chunks of something meat-like that managed to be both chewy and stringy. Maybe now is a good time to become a vegetarian like Beckett's family. Would Grandma and Grandpa ever know if I decided last minute to be a vegetarian of convenience? How much did Grandma and Grandpa actually know about me anyway? Could I trick them into thinking I was someone totally different from the girl I was at home? Maybe here in Thistledo, I could be Maya the Brave, Maya the Fearless, Maya the Magnificent, Maya who never let anyone down and didn't almost kill her own sister. I stared out the car window at the trees whizzing by. In the distance, a giant metal tower rose up above the tree line. Back home, the Chicago skyline was huge, colorful, shiny, and one of my favorite sights on earth. This single spindly tower rising up above the never-ending forest was the closest thing to a skyline for hundreds of miles. What's that? I asked, pointing. The fire tower, Grandma B said. I closed my eyes and tried to unsee it. In the back seat, I heard Mom suck in a breath through her teeth, but she remained silent. It already felt like I was all on my own here in Minnesota, in the strange place with almost strangers. Mom's head and heart were obviously already back in Chicago with my dad and sister, which was where she belonged. Me? I belonged here, banished to a place where I could do no further harm. Do you know the town was built around that tower? Grandma asked, gesturing at it with her chin. I couldn't tell if she'd noticed me tense up at the word fire or if she'd heard the first sound Mom had made since we'd left the airport. I'm sure she could guess it wasn't anyone's favorite subject at the moment. I didn't know that, I said quietly. Rumor has it, she said, glancing at me. Some folks at the Forest Service were looking for a good spot to set up a tower to watch for forest fires. 
They just kept moving through the forest until one of them guys stopped and said, You know what? This'll do. I stared out at the tower, looming over everything, looking out, keeping watch, climbing up above the treetops into the wind and rain and lightning. To climb it, you would have to force yourself to trust a rickety old structure that could collapse at any second. My stomach turned at the thought. I rolled down my window a tiny bit to get some fresh air. Get it? Grandma B asked, glancing at me. This'll do. This'll do. Oh, I choked out something that sounded like a laugh. Yeah. A population sign marked the edge of town. This'll do. Population 500. 500 people exactly? I asked. Nah, Grandma said, slowing to a crawl as we drove into town. 500 more or less. People die. A few are bar born each year. No one wants to admit we're smaller than 500 nowadays. Not worth making a new sign. As we drove through town, I took stock of the businesses that lined Main Street. The Main Street through town was actually called Main Street, which I found satisfying. There was a bank, a small grocery store, a cafe, three different bar restaurants, two gas stations, one on each end of town, a hardware store, and an antique shop. It had to be the most cliched and old-fashioned small town in the history of small towns. Nothing's changed, Mom muttered, finally speaking for the first time in nearly an hour. I'd started to wonder if she'd forgotten we were in the car with her. Maya, this place looks exactly like it did when I was a kid. Oh, I said, turning to flash her a smile, encouraging her to keep talking, to tell me more. That's cool. The penny candy at the Y store went up to a dime apiece, Grandma told her in a stiff voice, so some things have changed. Are you still working there, Ma? Mom asked. Most days, Grandma B said, pointing at the enormous, brightly lit gas station at the edge of town. Maya, that's the Y store, where I work as a cashier. Why are there two gas stations in a town this small? I wondered aloud. Is there a difference between them? Gas is three cents cheaper on this end of town, and we sell ice cream cones. Al's service shop on the other end of town has a slushy machine and free air. Free air? I turned and watched town disappear out the back window of the car. We'd driven the entire length of it in less than 30 seconds. For tires, Grandma told me, making a sound with her tongue that suggested I should have known that already. Grandma B veered off Main Street, just past the Y store. The only thing I could remember about their house from our last visit was that it sat at the very end of town, on the very end of a dead-end road. Grandma B and Grandpa Howard's place was literally the last house in Thistle Do proper. It marked the end of the road, in a town Dad had told me was nicknamed the end of the road. This was the last town for miles. Beyond Thistle Do, there was nothing but the wild forests and lakes that made up the boundary waters canoe area wilderness, which led directly into the Quetico Provincial Park in Canada. We were as much in the middle of nowhere as one could possibly be, and a part of me was grateful for the escape. The old Buick rambled down the rocky road my grandparents lived on. There were two other houses on this short spur of road that forked off Main Street. The three houses were spaced pretty far apart, but they all shared one big yard. Unlike our neighborhood, there were no fences or hedges to mark where one property ended and another began. I hope you like your neighbors, I said, just to say something. Mom had disappeared back into her silence. Grandma grunted. I wasn't sure if that was a yes or a no. The house next to my grandparents' house looked abandoned. The grass was long and there was a faded for sale sign leaning against the crumbling front steps. The only sign of life was a pot of dead flowers on the bottom step. Where did Mrs. Minty go? My mom asked. I turned around to look at her, realizing I only had one more day to see her face in person before she abandoned me here. Mom was pointing to the empty looking house. Did she move? She died, Grandma said bluntly, about a year or so ago. No one's bought the house yet. Mom opened her mouth as if she wanted to say something, but then she closed it again. I heard her sniffle, and I realized she was crying, probably about Mrs. Minty being dead. Her emotions, usually very much under control, had been pretty messed up since the fire. Grandma pulled her into her driveway 
and turned off the car. None of us moved to get out. The car clicked as it cooled in the still afternoon air. Finally, Mom opened her door with a sigh. She grabbed her backpack off the seat next to her and trudged inside the house, leaving me to handle my suitcase full of borrowed clothes by myself. I know she was distracted by everything happening with Amelia, so she probably forgot I had stuff that needed to get inside the house, too. Part of me hoped she had conveniently forgotten all about my bag, because a part of her didn't want to leave me here alone with these strange old people. I wondered if she was at all sad to say goodbye and leave me for the summer. I wondered if she realized I was the one who destroyed our lives and our home. I wondered if she blamed me. I wondered if I'd ever get my life back. But more than anything, I wondered, when would I be allowed to go home again? 